be able to, you know, even Pakistan, you know, when you cross the borders, you know, come on. So the point is, these kind of fools, they should not be allowed to rule. This, this kind of extremist ideology that is not realistic in its approach and its ideas cannot rule. You cannot allow them to rule. And this is exactly what people like Jinnah, Iqbal, Sayyid Ahmad Khan could see. They could foresee that this is a high possibility. This can happen. That's why they started to campaign for a separate homeland. They started to say there is no way that we will be successful as a community in a united India with these people. With these people. Okay? No doubt they were sincere people in Congress. No doubt they had good intentions. People like Gandhi, we give it to him. Gandhi was, uh, you know, in most of the things he did were noble. I mean, we don't agree with everything he did and said, but he, he had good noble intentions. He wanted a united India, a good India for Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs. But Gandhi was idealistic. Gandhi was not realistic. He was clearly ignoring the reality on the ground. In fact, he could see it in his life when there were riots taking place and when he went on a hunger strike in Bengal, right? Because there were riots going on. Hindus are killing Muslims, Muslims are killing Hindus, right? How this happened, how we got there is a very good question and the British Raj had a lot to do with it. The divide and rule uh, tactic and strategy, it always worked in their favor and they continued to rule. The British, I, I believe, still would have ruled India if it wasn't for the, the, the two world wars. Okay, so what changed? The First and the Second World War changed everything. And the British were already taxing the Indians heavily to the extent that the railway that was put in India to take all the important things uh, to Britain and abroad, right? The railway was not put for the Indians to benefit Indians because the Indians were the poorest people in the world when the, Brit when the British uh, rule ended in India in 1947. 90% of the Indian population was be below the poverty line. So how did that railway line benefit the Indians? It didn't. That railway line was an organized robbery. So this was, the British rule in India was uh, organized crime on the government level. When the government itself was the culprit. So the British government at the time I'm not blaming Queen Victoria here. I'm blaming her ruling establishment in India. Don't forget these people, Victoria may never see them and vice versa, right? So these people do their own thing. They are racist, they are bigoted, they are supremacists, the white supremacists, a lot of them, including Churchill, right? Churchill, of course, lived later on, um, but he was one of those examples and we will talk about him very quickly because I have to finish. Right. So uh, Victoria herself was a very kind hearted woman. She was a very good woman. OK, she had no idea most of the time what's happening in her empire. She didn't know what her people, her administrators are doing in India and in Africa and in Australia. OK, to the Aborigines. She had no idea or in Canada, for that matter, what's happening to the natives. Right. She herself was a very kind hearted woman. And there's a very touching story of Victoria and a Muslim servant of hers, right? She took him as a son. His name was Abdul Karim. And you must read this book titled Victoria and Abdul. They even made a movie on this, right? Victoria and Abdul. So this is a true story hidden from the world for nearly 100 years. How many people knew about Victoria and Abdul before this book was published? How many people? No one knew. Even I'm, I'm like, I consider myself a serious student of history, right? I, I had no idea who Abdul Karim was until this book came out. I'm thinking, what? Abdul Karim, who is this? So when I studied him, Victoria was learning how to read Urdu from him. He was teaching her how to write Urdu. In her private personal diaries, Victoria has written Urdu. Abdul Karim became so close to her that he was present at her deathbed. And he was like her son. You know, she, he, Allah Alam, how sincere he was, how nice he was to her. She would, when he became sick, she would come to his quarter personally to ask about him. The family became jealous. The royal family at the time, a bunch of racist bigots, right, including Victoria's son, the future King Edward, right? 
uh, he became, they all became jealous that this Indian slave or Indian man, why is he so close to her? And most importantly, he's a Muslim. What the hell is he doing so close to the queen herself, right? So they removed him. After Queen Victoria died, he was forcefully, brutally removed from his house, sent back to India. All the correspondence was burnt. And what remained of the story was somehow hidden by the family, okay? And that information was used by this author who wrote the book, Victoria and Abdul. She was a very kind woman. And she stopped the atrocities during the 19, sorry, 1857 mutiny, right? So she cannot be blamed. But the establishment in India that was ruling the viceroys, the generals, and uh, the administrators predominantly were a bunch of racist white supremacists. They had no respect for Indians. That's why people who rose as a reaction to this brutality, albeit social, political, economic brutality on the part of the British, the reaction was very hard. People like Gandhi. You know why Gandhi became Gandhi? Do you know what happened to him? Gandhi was an attorney at law. He studied here in Britain, right? He goes back to South Africa. He sits in the train where only white people could sit, right? So the conductor comes and he asks him, what are you doing? You're Indian. What are you doing in this white box? And he said, well, I'm an attorney at law. He said, I don't care. You are an Indian. Get out. He threw him out. So Gandhi realized, hold on, why is this happening to us? Why is this happening to us? This is happening to us because we are a bunch of slaves. So he comes, long story short, for that you're going to have to read the story of Gandhi. He comes back, right? Similarly, Jinnah. Jinnah was an Anglophile or Anglicized Indian Muslim. He, was, he came from an Ismaili family and later on changed his uh, religion to Sunni Islam. How do we know that? Because he left in his will that his janaza must be led by Shabir Ahmad Uthmani, Mufti Shabir Ahmad Uthmani, who was, if I'm not mistaken, the grandfather of the current Mufti of Pakistan. Okay? Also the grandfather of Mufti Taki Uthmani. Right? So Jinnah left a wasiya, a will that my janaza should be led by this man. So Jinnah had changed drastically. A lot of people point to him and they say he was a secularist, he was an Anglophile, he was eating bacon sandwiches, he was playing pool, keeping dogs. No, you don't look at Jinnah when he was 30 years old or 40 years, you look at Jinnah when he was 70 years old, right? He was a very religious man by that time. And Jinnah was a staunch member of the Congress party. It was later on when Jinnah realized that this party is not sincere with Muslims. So he left the party and he went back to Britain, became a lawyer, a barrister of the top, uh, the, the top uh, magnitude to the, to the extent that he was one of the richest, one of the most successful barristers in Britain. He had an English chauffeur. For an Indian man to have an English chauffeur in Britain at that time was a big deal, right? Only princes could do something like that, right, from India. So Iqbal comes to Jinnah and asks him, to lead the Muslims in their fight for independence because there is no sincere leader there for the Muslims. So Iqbal found Jinnah to be that man. Jinnah goes back and he becomes the leader of Muslim League. Muslim League, according to some Hindu activists in India, it was established by the British as a rival to Congress party to weaken the Congress party, but that's not the case. And that may be true on the part of the British, may be true, but the Muslim leaders were not working for the British. They wanted their own objectives to be met and their objective was to have a separate homeland for the Muslims so that the Muslims don't end up in a situation where they are today where Muslims are being brutalized on daily basis they are being told to say Jai Shri Ram or die their masjids are being attacked on daily basis their clothes are being ripped from their bodies Muslim girls are being raped and the culprits are not punished by the courts. The entire system, I'm not saying this, Rahul Gandhi, recently the, the leader of the Congress party, which is a secular party, right? He said it, that we are not fighting against um, one political party, which is the BJP. We are fighting against an establishment, 
because the BJP has planted its culprits and its agents in every single uh, Indian institution. They have the people in the military, they have the people in the judiciary, they have the people in the police, they have the people in the municipalities, they have the people everywhere. And what is the goal? To clean India of Muslims, to cleanse India of Muslims. Am I making this up, brothers? Go and listen to the speeches of these BJP mouthpieces. Some of them are openly calling for a genocide of the Muslims. Openly. And this is not even a controversial statement to make anymore because it's so open. It is so well known, right? This is what Jinnah, Iqbal, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and uh, 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 other Muslim intellectuals could see coming. All the freedom fighters, all the, the independence uh, founding fathers of uh, Pakistan, they, were, they could see that if there is a united India, this is a high possibility. What's happening now is a high possibility. And lo and behold, what they feared has come to pass. This is exactly what they feared, that Muslims will become second-class citizens in India with no protection. And in fact, when the partition happened in 1947, Jinnah said, now the Indian Muslims will spend the rest of their lives proving their loyalty to India. Unfortunately, this is what's happening today. A lot of Indian Muslims are pressurized into saying things to prove their loyalty, that they are loyal to India as citizens. This is absolutely absurd. This is crazy, right? So this is why they went for a separate homeland.